All right, we're going to go ahead and give this a shot. I'm going to see if I can move this thing around. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, today we are going to go over uh, how one goes about starting a credit union. So um, first thing I went to is uh, mycreditunion.gov uh, slash about dash credit union dash unions slash find join start. Um, and so they actually have resources here. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and see how to do this. There's a start credit union thing. So the whole context of this channel is um, I thought it'd be interesting to see what it takes to start a credit union. Um, people somehow start banks, people somehow start credit unions, and somehow they figure it out. And I don't know how that works. And I don't see a lot of resources out there that show every single step and all the kind of the stages and everything that goes through. So what we're going to do is just go ahead and take a look at this and see what we can do. Maybe as a result of this, I, I do software stuff also. So as a result of this, um, maybe I'll be able to write like a Python script that will help um, automatically figure out a lot of the bits and pieces that I need to do and kind of build that pipeline uh, so that when we're ready to do this, we're, we're just kind of in good shape. So um, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this thing here. Uh, so we've got how to start a credit union. Um, <clears throat> And so, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to probably read out loud some of the stuff that I'm reading. And then I know that I, I've done this before, uh, just the very, very first like step or so, which is um, is that I've downloaded, there's a PDF that comes along with this uh, that kind of goes through all the different steps that you need to do. So I'll go ahead and start reading this. And then uh, and then we'll just hopefully have a bunch of posts of videos that uh, I will be working on this. So um, start a credit union. Are you thinking about starting a federal credit union that would help? others as well as yourself where you work or members of an association or your community on how to start the process of starting a new federal credit union. So that's kind of what we're looking at doing here. So there's a uh, federal credit union charter applications guide, uh, which provides, direct, provides direction on applying for a federal credit union charter. Uh, this guides five parts include step-by-step -step guidance and examples to help you get your proposed credit union uh, group and navigate the process successfully. So uh, let me just look here real quick. I, I know there was a PDF and that might be the PDF. I just wanted to make sure that I've got the right one here. Uh, yeah, so so let's just go ahead and um, I wonder if I can just, if I click on it, it'll download and then it'll, because the problem is, is we need to make sure that it shows up in this, uh, this tab here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to paste it over this URL and hopefully everything will just magically work. So hopefully this has continued to to work. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Here's the uh, the charter application guide, and so um, <clears throat> we'll just go ahead and start reading some of this and, and see what we've got here. So I, this guide provides direction on applying for a credit union charter, a federal credit union charter specifically. Um, this guide's five parts include step by step guidance and examples to help you. Uh, help you propose for a credit union. So uh, throughout this whole channel, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the credit union that I'm thinking about starting. Um, but rather than actually starting, and I'm going to take my glasses off so that way I don't have weird reflections. Um, so uh, I, I'm definitely going to try and avoid mentioning any name of my, the credit union that I'm going to try to start. Um, mostly because if you're following along this and I'm posting these as I'm doing it, uh, it's the internet. There's people. They, uh, they may try to take any name that I attempt to get. So uh, I'm going to keep the name quiet until uh, we kind of maybe get to a point where we have it, um, I don't know if the right word is registered, but registered for us, and then we can kind of follow down that process. So uh, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and do that. And so I'm going to continue to read this thing here. Um, there's the five parts. Uh, it's most efficient to complete parts one and three in the order listed. Uh, each step is a part also in suggested order of completion, and we recommend you submit each part for the NCUA review and feedback before proceeding to the next part. Any start, step within a part may be submitted when completing. So, uh, for example, if you've come up with a name that you want to use, uh, I believe that's kind of one of the early parts. And so what you do is you go to your search. If the name's available, you go ahead and submit a submit a request to get that. Um, that's kind of like the, the, the brief thing. So we'll, we'll get to it, though. So each submitted step or part will be reviewed by the NCUA as to its adequacy, and NCUA will let the, the proposed federal credit union know when they should proceed to the next step or part. Uh, they need to find that all steps have been completed before a charter can be approved. So that's kind of your first stages. So part one, uh, steps one through three covers what you should research before starting the chartering process. So this whole, this whole video series is going to go over what I'm researching, how I'm researching it, and everything. And, and hopefully... Through this process, uh, anybody else that's following that wants to start a credit union will will learn from my mistakes, and they'll say, "Hey, oh, we saw that Tyson did this thing way down here, but if we'd have done it way back here, 
we may be in better shape. And hopefully I will also have that benefit. Uh, and so, you know, if I ever find myself in a situation where I need to start a second credit union, that's crazy. Um, I, I might already know how to do it. So that would be kind of cool. So uh, part two, uh, or I'm sorry, part one. Uh, so yeah, it covers the research stuff. It also covers how to establish a name and a field of membership for your, your proposed federal credit union. So uh, we'll get into those. Part two uh, is the support and location. So you want to identify your subscribers, security and funding, start up an operational costs, identifying a location, and completing a survey of the potential field of membership. So ideally, what I would love to have is a um, is a credit union that's uh, 100% online, but I don't even know if that's possible at this point. So as we go through this process, maybe we'll discover it's not possible. Maybe we'll discover that it is an option. Um, I, the idea of having a 100% online uh, system is that then it's all, you know, we're doing it all through software as much as possible. And, and I like that idea anyways. So uh, because in theory, a lot of that stuff can be tracked a little bit uh, differently than in person. So um, so the next thing we've got is assembling your package. This is steps uh, eight through 15. So this covers uh, your operational and financial plans for this proposed credit union. It covers finding a mentor, identifying officials and staff, and developing a detailed and realistic business and marketing plan, uh, completing the charter forms, and developing bylaws, policies, and procedures. So um, I'm currently a member of credit union, and there, so this may be something that I can go ask my credit union what they what their all of these uh, this data is, but I don't know what it is, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons that I was interested in um, in kind of following this process is to understand. Um, maybe what typical bylaws look like. So as I'm starting to fill these out, they may get kicked back to me from the NCUA saying, hey, this doesn't have the right kind of details. This doesn't have things that make sense. And then I'll learn like what logical by bylaws are, uh, what logical policies and procedures are, and then I'll have more insight into things. Uh, so the next part is step 16 and 17. This discusses, discusses the NCUA's actions upon determining you've met the requirements for your charter to be approved. And then finally, part five is that there's 13 attachments, A through M. A is a checklist recapping, recapping the documentation requirements for steps one through 15. Uh, the other attachments are examples and templates, uh, resources, materials, and links, etc. So let's go ahead on to part one. All right, cool. So uh, the Office of Consumer Protection Division of Consumer Access is responsible for the chartering process and issuing the credit unions of charter. For information and questions regarding this process, please contact them at the, the given phone number or a particular uh, email address. So documentation for all steps should be submitted to the following uh, physical address. So it looks like probably what's gonna happen is that we're going to uh, we're gonna fill out some documentation and then we're gonna have to physically mail it. So one opportunity if we're wanting to kind of maybe build a pipeline or a software thing is that um, we can have these pieces built into a already kind of pre-existing system where uh, once we've submitted some stuff, it automatically goes to a, a mailing company. And so again, we can do it 100% digital. So from my desk, uh, ideally what I can do is I can I can fill out whatever the document is, have it automatically submit, and then that will automatically send it to this, uh, this office. And so then that saves us, uh, again, the effort, if you will, which is really not much effort, but I like the idea of kind of pipelining things. So let's just see how this works. Um, so uh, we've got that that piece down. So they offer free consulting services with the charting process. So that means that, um, or sorry, NCUA does. I, I don't know. Let's see here. Yeah, so so NCUA will offer free consulting. So as I have questions, I can, I can reach out to them and ask questions. So um, where possible, I will include those videos here. Uh, if I'm if I'm not able, so it's funny because I'm looking at the video and it's, anyway, so I'll try to I'll try to not do that to you guys. All right, so, so as I have questions, I will go ahead and try to ask uh, ask them uh, for clarification answers, and then from there uh, I'll try and feed that back here. I, I don't know if it's necessarily appropriate to kind of include them on a, like if I get a phone call with somebody or you know sending emails back and forth. I don't want to kind of give away people's names and stuff like that, and so um, we're going to kind of kind of keep that stuff constrained here. So I'll just give kind of a, a review of those things as I get them every time we can make a video. So, um, and so, so awesome. We've got the, the ability to have free consulting. Um, these services which are available once you receive your preliminary field of membership approval are offered by the Office of Small Credit Union Initiatives. Uh, this, this group is committed to helping small credit unions survive and thrive, which we probably will be a small one. Um, they recognize the unique role low income uh, designated and new credit union uh, plays in the lives of their members and communities. So, so some other things that that will end up being a part of this is, uh, you know, finding finding I guess the funds to be able to start this credit union. Uh, I did a little bit of looking. It's been a few months back, or whatever, but uh, it said something to the effect of if it, if you want to have about a million dollars in assets, 
uh, I believe it was assets, capital assets or something. And I'm probably going to be learning on the terminology here. Um, also, by the way, I am not a finance person. Uh, I am actually a software engineer uh, by trade. So uh, this will be a very interesting kind of experience and foray into this. So, um, so yeah, I'll have to I'll have to find funding. And so if you if you want to have like a million in assets, you need to have at least a hundred thousand dollars essentially in deposits or or kind of your your base startup stuff. So so, um, so that's kind of some good numbers to come in mind with. And and if if I want to say hey like I'm cool having at most a million dollar credit union business, then cool, we're good there. Um, and then we can choose to to grow from there if we want. I don't know, but um, so let's see here. Um, so, th so it says that the assistance offered through this OSCUI, NCUA's Office of Small Credit Union Initiatives, uh, includes consulting, training, and grants if, if it's been low-income designated. So um, I don't know if low-income means that we have a very small quantity of dollars starting with or if that means that it's only for people who are low-income people. I don't know. We'll figure it out. So you can contact them at the above address uh, by calling again, the given phone number, uh, or emailing, they have another uh, email I just provided. So additional information on the role uh, of this of this group is going to be provided in the frequently asked questions. So let's see here. Um, so they said that they'll try to keep this guide up to date as much as possible. So uh, we're just going to continue on down this path. So I'm going to skip some of these kind of note to user stuff because I, I don't need to worry about those things. So um, frequently asked questions. Uh, one of them is, how long does it take to charter a federal credit union? Uh, so the time required to complete the process varies depending on the subscribers, knowledge, expertise, plan services, and timeliness in submitting the required data. However, organizers working closely with NCUA and completing the process step by step has an average range from one year to three years, depending on the complexity of their business model. So um, if we're able to have a low complexity model, we could potentially do this in a year. Um, it would be amazing if we could do it even faster, but let's just see, let's let's shoot for the year. Um, and if it takes longer, it takes longer, then no big deal, right? So how much startup and capital funding is needed? Aha, this is, this is back to what we were talking about. So funding usually in the form of donations and grants is necessary to co cover the startup costs uh, to absorb its net operating losses until it achieves a positive net earnings and to maintain an adequate capital position. The amount of funding varies and is contingent upon their desired initial services, business model, and overall proposed operating structure. Most services and related costs often equates, or I'm sorry, more services and related costs often equates to more funding. The actual amount necessary will not be able to be fully determined until you've completed the pro forma financial statements and plans for operating depending, which, which I don't know for sure what these words uh, necessarily mean, but I, I'm going to speculate that once we've identified kind of how this thing's going to run uh, and, and we've you know, documented, okay, we think that we can, you know, you know, our assumptions are that we're going to take these kind of loans and we're going to provide this kind of rate, uh, you know, and then, and then we should see this kind of income and we're going to pay people these kinds of money, uh, monies, if you will, uh, and, and then go that kind of out. So uh, I'm assuming that's what that means. Again, we'll continue on and we'll figure it out. So, uh, however, if you want to estimate the amount of funding required, uh, they suggest using a, at a minimum, the lesser of $300,000 or $100,000 per million in projected assets during the first five years of their operations. So what that kind of seems to mean is that let's say you want to have um, 10 million in projected assets. Well, then you really should have at least three hundred thousand dollars available to kind of get you through that first kind of that that hump phase of because what you're going to have is you're going to have people working there so you're going to have people if this is a physical office you're going to have tellers you're going to have loan officers you're going to have all these people looking at documents handling transactions and you have to pay them and so um, until you can really start getting enough uh, enough loans out and enough other things out that you have enough incoming uh, funds that can pay those as well as start to make a profit. That's probably what that's kind of referring to. Um, now, if, you're, if your game plan is, let's say my game plan is that I'm only going to worry about having about a million dollars in projected assets. Hopefully that means it's going to be a very small uh, credit union in terms of the number of people working there, the number of, of, of folks that we're going to have to basically be paying. And so uh, in this case, hopefully at most it will only cost us about $100,000 in kind of startup funding to be able to make this happen. Um, my kind of when I originally was reading this, my assumption uh, was really more that we needed to have that amount of money in deposit so that when we go out and loan, because there's this uh, this concept called fractional reserve banking, which means that 
you can loan out more money than you physically have. And so my assumption was, is that if we assume a 10 a 10 X uh, fractional reserve amount, then if you put a hundred thousand dollars into the bank account, you should be able to get a million dollars uh, in loans out against that. Uh, and then from there, start building up. So I don't know if that's kind of what the relationship here is, but again, we'll, we'll see what we figure out as we go. Um, so let's see here. So, so they're going to give us an example. So for example, if you want the P uh, the, your, your chartered credit union to grow to 5 million in assets by the end of year five, um, then you, the organizers should obtain pre-charter at least 500,000 in commitments for startup donated capital. The amount, these amounts are only estimates and additional funding may be needed. So um, that doesn't a hundred percent match with what I was understanding it to be. Um, so that, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not really sure because typically the meaning of lesser or, you know, at a minimum, the lesser of 300,000 or a hundred thousand would be if you're looking at doing, uh, you know, some, some amount, it's going to be less, but maybe it's, oh, so it's, it's a hundred thousand per million. So if you want to do 5 million, you need to do, um, 500,000. So, so the wording of this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because, uh, you you will always you know, if, if you have three million that you're interested in doing you're gonna have three hundred thousand. If you do four million, then you're gonna have four hundred thousand, which is going to be uh, less than three hundred thousand. So so yeah, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure kind of how that relates, but we'll continue on with that. Um, I'm I'm not. We'll see. Let's see here. So let's scroll on down. Uh, so they offer assistance to organizers. So we already totally talked about this. The um, the OSCUI will will do some help to try and uh, get you going. And so uh, once you've received your preliminary field of membership approval, um, then then you're going to be good to go. So let's go ahead and skip past this because we've kind of already covered this. So let's see here. So it does look like that once once we've been chartered, uh, there will be a district exam examiner and supervisory examiner uh, to the credit union, and they will complete on-site examinations and are responsible for overseeing the regulatory supervision and safety and soundness of the new credit union. So uh, an EDS will also be assigned to continue providing free consultation services for the new federal credit union their first three years. So I don't see what EDS, let's see here, I'm, I'm guessing EDS is maybe defined a little bit higher up here. Uh, economic development specialist. So um, they'll be assigned to continue providing free services for the next, the first three years, which is kind of cool. Um, so they'll, they'll be talking about more things in step eight, it looks like, uh, regarding some of these other resources. And so let's go ahead and get on to um, part one of this. Oh, so here's table of contents, which not terribly relevant here, uh, since we're going to be covering everything kind of somewhat linearly anyways. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, it's good to define what a credit union is. So a credit union is a member owned and controlled not-for-profit cooperative financial institution formed to permit groups of persons to save, borrow, and obtain financial services and to participate in its management. Membership ownership, Member ownership and control are what makes credit unions unique. So the difference here is that when you put money in a savings account in a credit union, you're basically buying shares of that credit union. Whereas with a bank, all you're doing is getting told, hey, you have money here and we'll give you some interest, but you don't have really any kind of ownership or say or anything to do with the bank. They just do what they want with the money and that goes into somebody's pocket. Whereas in at least the idea behind a credit union is that because I've put money into the bank, I have some say in how the bank should uh, should operate. Again, assuming that it's following its bylaws and its policies and procedures. So I can, I can help with voting or, or different things like that. So um, the Federal Credit Union Act as amended sets forth federal credit unions. Uh, so there's an attachment L for a direct, direct link to the Federal Credit Union Act. Uh, let's go ahead and skip that for now. Uh, we may look at that later um, if we find that we need it. Uh, so membership is limited to a group or multiple groups, each defined in the credit union's charter, each of which have a common bond of occupation or association or is located within a well-defined neighborhood, community, or rural district. So for example, um, I live in a particular city, so maybe I could say that my my city uh, might be might be one of these kind of well defined uh, communities, if you will. Uh, I'm also I do software engineering, so maybe I could say that my software engineering is a a common bond of occupation or uh, or association, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's a possibility. So. Let's see here. Um, so I kind of started talking about this already, but uh, member deposits into the credit union, otherwise known as shares, allow the member to become the member to become an owner of the credit union with the right to vote. So that that was one of the important things that I was talking about is that the difference between a bank and a credit union is that with a bank, you put your money in there, they give you a really poor interest rate, 
but then that's it. Like you don't have any say in anything. Whereas with me- with a credit union, you actually can choose, hey, I'm going to vote for or against a particular person. So these shares provide a primary funding for the lending and investment activities of the credit union. So when you put money into a bank account, uh, they will use that money as the multiplier, like I, like I referred to in the uh, fractional reserve banking. Now with the credit union, you're, they're going to be doing the exact same thing. Uh, and so, so that gives you, gives you an idea anyways. Um, and so the other nice thing is that for every dollar or, or every share you put in, um, actually, no, I'm sorry. I totally didn't even realize this. Each member gets a vote regardless of how many shares. So, so what that, that's actually kind of cool from my perspective. I didn't even realize that. Um, <clears throat> this is, this is honestly the first thing, first time that I've read this particular piece. So as long as I have a share, I get a vote. Even if I have 10,000 shares, I have a hundred thousand shares. I get one vote. So that's kind of cool that I, that I have like kind of equal say among all of my other members uh, within my credit union. So that, that, so I really like that idea. So the credit union is governed by a board of directors elected by and from the credit union's membership. So you have to be a member and then you can be elected and, and, and voted on. Uh, board and other committee members serve on a volunteer basis and are charged with acting in the best interest of all members. Professional managers and staff may be compensated, but only one board officer may be compensated. So uh, anybody that's on the board, at most only one can get paid. Uh, and then outside of that, if you have managers, staff, etc., you can get paid. So I, I don't know exactly every single member that belongs on a board. Uh, I don't know if that includes you know, bank presidents or things like that. If the bank president is considered a professional manager, then they can get paid as well as a board member. I don't know that yet, but we'll figure that out as we go along. So the credit national federal credit union or the federal credit union act also establishes an independent executive agency within the federal government for the supervision of federal credit unions known as the NCUA, which is what we've been talking about here in the national credit union administration. They charter and supervise federal credit unions and they're backed by the full faith of the U S government. They ensure savings of members and eligible non-members to at least $250,000 in all federal credit unions and many state chartered credit unions. So this is very simple. I believe similar to how banks uh, banks work as well. I believe they call it FDIC in banks, um, but they'll they'll cover at least two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You have the same insurance here uh, in a credit union, so that's actually a really nice thing to have. All right, so here is the meat of things. This is where we get to start. So part one is is the preliminary work. So I think at this point we're going to go ahead and give it a stop, and then the next video we'll start working from part one. But we've kind of gotten all of the basis and the, uh, you know, kind of the, the frequently asked questions covered and all that kind of stuff. And now we're going to start looking at this. And this is going to cover the research of the Federal Credit Charter you, um, that we're looking at doing and picking your name and all that kind of stuff. So thank you for joining me. Um, I look forward to having you follow along on this crazy adventure. Um, and everything I can possibly share about this adventure, I will absolutely share. Um, I think it's I think it's important for people to understand how money works and how all these uh these different things happen and how you can start these businesses. Um, it's probably definitely, certainly, absolutely not a trivial process, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it works and, and, and hopefully uh, you also enjoy it. Thank you. I'm also using screen software that I don't know how to use, so we'll see if we can stop it.